tonight's exciting drama, The Turning Point, is reminiscent of a recent national investigation. A giant syndicate has such complete control of a large American city that even a government committee cannot unmask the criminal. And as our stars of this thrilling Paramount picture, we have Fred McMurray and Joe Andrew. Now, Act One of A Turning Point, starring Fred McMurray as Jerry and Joe Andrew as Amanda. <laughs> Tougher, more corrupt towns in the country than our town. But from where I sat on the Daily Chronicle, I couldn't see any. I couldn't see him for dirt. So when I heard that Johnny Conroy had been made special prosecutor to clean up crime, it gave me quite a jolt. Johnny Conroy, the fair-haired kid I grew up with, matching ideals against the brass knuckles of Neil Eichelberger's syndicate. The brilliant young Professor John Conroy, if you please, with Ivy still twining in his collegiate hair against no holes barred Neil Eichelberger. I shuddered. I sat it out while Johnny set up his headquarters on the mezzanine of the Harrison Hotel. I left the rosy preliminaries to the greeters, the dreamers, and all the other happiness people who didn't have the heart or the sense to let Johnny know what he was in for. How about it, Mr. Conroy? Can we say you've been given extraordinary powers to break up the crime syndicate so-called in this town? And does that mean Neil Eichelberger's mob, Mr. Conroy? If it turns out to be Eichelberger, we'll take care of it, boys. Well, what specifically are you after, Mr. Conroy? Everything illegal. Bookies, graft, corruption, gambling. You think the Eichelberger syndicate controls all this? Well, if it does, we'll find it out, break it up. Yeah. May we have a last picture, Mr. Conroy? Oh. Please, gentlemen, Johnny has to go to well, work. Just one more picture. Yes, sir, boys. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, shaking hands with the district attorney. Yeah. How's this? Oh, Fine. All right, get it, Gus. Got it. Thank you, Mr. Conroy. I want to tell the press I'm going to need your help. I know you'll go along with me. I'll give you everything I can. My headquarters are going to remain right here, spread all over the mezzanine of the Harrison Hotel, so you know where to find me. Thanks a lot, boys. Thank you, gentlemen. Let us through, please. Let us through. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, dear. After that, Neil Eichelberger will be a vacation. No. We've got to get organized. Shall I make it 12.30 at the mayor's office, Johnny? Yeah. At 8.30 and a plush place dear to your heart for dinner. Hmm? Request filed for consideration pending fulfillment of official duties. <laughs> I'm awfully doggone in love with you, uptown girl. Yes, sweet, Johnny. Hi, right, Johnny. Jerry, Jerry McKibber. Uh, it's good to see you again, good Johnny. Good to see you again. Jerry McKibben of the Chronicle? Oh, I'm sorry. Amanda Waycross, Jerry McKibben. How do you do? Hi. Uh, Amanda's helping me out. Combination of Girl Friday and spiritual advisor. Also picnics on weekends. Oh. Amanda Waycross, huh? The Waycrosses? Oh. Why? I just wanted to get the outfit, name, and rank correct for publication. How uh, you got into a crime wave to be quite a story on the society page. Congratulations, Johnny. Thanks, Jerry. Jerry and I grew up together on Caroline Street. Well, it's nice you've both got such important friends in each other. Yes, isn't it? Johnny, there are all kinds of messages, none less than cosmic, and your mother calls. Oh, yeah, I promised I'd have late breakfast with Mom and Dad. Come along, Jerry, we can talk. Bye. And lunch at 12.30 with the mayor. I'll get fat on this job. You want to bet? Now, very good stuff, Jerry. Very tough, very bright. Now, tough is what you've got to be. Bright help. I know. I'd like you to help my committee. Oh, come on in with us. Does press secretary or a guy to point out Neil Eichelberger and his merry men to you? Write your own tickets. Ah, uh -uh, sorry. Why not? Because I'm a professional newspaper man and not an amateur crime buster. Don't match dream boys and fair-haired girls against foes like the Eichelberger mob. Amanda? You too. You were always a kid with a dream on your face. Clean hands, pure heart, no political ambitions all better, darling. Yeah, that's me. You're a sucker, Johnny. You know what you're up against here. This isn't criminal law 205 at the university, Professor Conroy. I know that. Then why did you let him suck you into this? You with your clean hands and pure heart and funny face. A happy little amateur. A kid standing in the sun with a book under his arm and the supply call falls on him. They'll say it was an accident. Maybe. But don't say anything like that to my mother. Your dad's a cop. He knows the facts of life. But he doesn't tell mom. Okay? Okay, sucker. <laughs> Uh, 
Are you sure you won't eat another baked apple, son? Oh, lunch with a mayor, Mom. He'll scowl if I don't eat with him. It's oh. the same old political game, son. Take it from an old hand. The election's coming up, and the governor wants to get some advertising out of this committee of yours. Now, what do you think, Jerry? You working on this with Johnny? No, I'm just doing a series on the personal life of the special prosecutor. The important thing, Mr. Conroy, is uh, how do you feel about it all? Well, I don't see how any committee in any hotel is... Well, how do you mean, Jerry? Haven't you heard from the department? By urgent request to the governor himself. You're my chief investigator. No. Why not, Matt? I won't have it. Why? What's the matter? I'm just a cop. Cop. You're the best criminal investigator on the force, and you know it. You're a professional, Mr. Conroy. I'm just a hard-working, hoodlum-pinching cop. And that's where I'm comfortable. But what we need most is a cop. An honest cop who knows his town inside out. That's you, Matt. Uh, uh, well, uh, Talk about it later. I've got to get back to work. Okay, take care, Matt. I will, honey. Nice to see you again. Well, goodbye, Matt. Honey, I thought he'd jump at it. Uh, thanks for the breakfast, Mrs. Conroy. Oh, it's a pleasure. I'll see you later, Johnny. I work, too. <laughs> I had work all right. I was afraid I wasn't going to like it. I followed Matt Conroy in my car. I saw Matt park his car and take a taxi downtown and doubled back. The taxi ended up on Caroline Street in front of Eamon Harrigan's office. Eamon Harrigan, political frontrunner for boss Neil Eichelberger. That afternoon, I paid a call on Neil Eichelberger. I expected Harrigan to be with him, and he was. Hello, Harrigan. Mr. Eichelberger? Yeah? The Cuban of the Chronicle. Yeah, I'm told. I thought you might like to make a statement. About what? Johnny Conroy, the special prosecutor. Hey, sure. I am happy that such an investigation is underway, since it can only clear me of all charges aimed at me by, uh, shall we say, the gentleman of the press? Thanks. Any time. Are you a friend of the Conroy family? I am not. Well, Harrigan, is that you, Harrigan? How do you mean, friend? Oh, we all grew up together on Caroline Street, Harrigan. That was years ago. That's funny. I, uh, I always thought you kept up that friendship. Think some more. I was sure you and Matt Conroy still, still spoke. We don't. Hmm. Funny I should think that. You guys got a diploma in journalism school, and you think it makes you something special. Don't believe it, McKibben. And it isn't funny. So long, McKibben. <laughs> It wasn't funny. It stank with corruption. But I went back to my office and wrote a starry-eyed story about how the young law professor was going to clean up crime. And how that honest cop, his own dad, was to be his special investigator. Johnny wanted his job like a ball of fire, I'll say that. Questioning goons and patsies and wise guys and gunsels for three weeks and getting nowhere slowly. Until he came across a slick, no-down... No good name, Tilbury, a former cop. All right, then, Mr. Tilbury. Suppose you listen to this. March 27th, you resigned from the police force. On the same day, you went to work for Eichelberger. The second day, the first day we talked terms. Selling whiskey, as you claim. Odd jobs. Killing people, odd jobs like that. You're cute, Johnny. You were taking down a lot of small-time bookmakers, and Eichelberger got you off. He did you a favor, you did him one. You arranged the Manzanati's killing. I never heard such junk in all my life. You were a cop, Silver, and you sold out. Never the last thing I do, I'm going to nail you. I'd rather nail one crooked cop than a hundred hooligans. Now, get out. You'll find Manzanati's wife with or without you. That's all. <laughs> May I read what you've written, Mr. McKibben? Well, it's written on the commission's rented premises about the commission. Uh, go ahead, but try not to look down your nose if you read it. You write very well. Hmm. The Amanda Waycross accolade for superior journalism. You don't think very much of what we're doing. Well, I think you're all as clever as all get out. For amateurs in society dilettante studies. For girls whose experience with crime is limited to parking tickets. Oh, I should think you'd think I'm quite a fellow to stick my cultivated nose into a professional clean-up campaign. As a matter of fact, I do. You're quite a girl, Miss Waycross. Only why would you want to walk barefoot across a pigsty? I want to help Johnny. A real professional would say, I hate crime and I want to step on it and maybe do myself some good at the same time. You don't care for me. 
I hate fumbling where it costs the game. The game isn't over yet, Mr. Jerry, Amanda, we're in business. Come in, pop up door. We've located Mr. Manzanetti. Oh, wonderful. He's right here in town, hiding out at 446 Farm Street, under the name of Mrs. Stefan Nova. Oh, is this for publication, Jerry? Oh, no, off the record, Jerry, please. Okay. Oh, Johnny, the first real bird. Better keep Mrs. Manzanetti's on ice. Pop will take care of that, won't you, Pop? Sure, son. Sure. Sure. Get her in at 10 tomorrow, Pop, will you, for sure? We've everything to be, son. We've waited a long time for this. See you in the morning. Right. Well, not bad for amateurs, Miss hmm, McKibben. If Mrs. Manzanotti talks. Well, what do you say we all go out to dinner somewhere? Might even treat with a good domestic campaign. Uh, no, thanks. I've got to work. I'll see you later. Now, Jerry, you'll keep this Manzanotti's break strictly hush hush. Hmm. I suppose the story leaks out. Do I still have to keep quiet? It won't be done. This happened to the committee before. If I were the professor, I'd question me, you, the DA, and the whole kit and caboodle. I'd screen everybody. You know there's been strings. Of course you know. So I'd screen them again. I'd get to know them back to the time they were born. However, I'm not running this committee. But if I were, I'd question my own mother. <laughs> It's open. Well, Miss Waycross, to what do I owe the honor? Given I want to talk to you. What happened to your champagne dinner with Johnny? We changed our plans. What about your hurry to get back to work? I had to do my flower arrangement. That thing you said is he left Johnny and me today. Well, that meant to be provocative. Look, would you mind sitting down, great lady, so I can throw myself at your feet? What did you mean this afternoon when you said you'd question everyone, even your own mother? Why don't you go home to your fireside and read a nice mystery story where everything comes out tidy at the end? What were you trying to tell Johnny to do? If you must know, I was hitting the jeweler square and Johnny's a square and you're standing in a cold suit and you don't know it. And you're a whale of a tough guy, Miss Hibbert. That I am. A real know-it-all guy. At home in the dirty, you know where the bodies are buried, but you won't tell. We're just ring around the rosy dabblers and you're a hard-boiled professional. Check. I want to know what you were really trying to tell Johnny today. The truth. Okay, uptown girl. As you so partly put it, the truth. Yeah, don't remove your sapphire mink. We're going for a ride. Well, this is it. Oh, Yonder is 446 Palm Street. Wherein is hidden Mrs. Manzanotti, alias Mrs. Stefanova. See murder witness in Johnny's office tomorrow at 10. Who are those men taking down the house? Upstairs and downstairs, near my lady's chamber, Mr. Neil Eichelberger's high class suit. No. They're probably convincing Mrs. Manzanotti that it would be unwise to do much talking tomorrow. What can we do? Nothing now. Eichelberger got here first. But how? Somebody leaked. Who? Hey, you want to go play? Mark someplace else with your job. Come on, Peter. Why? Who are you? The police. Come on, slow. That was Roy Ackerman. I could look at Lord High Executioner. Who would it talk? I'll take you home. My car is outside your apartment. Who would talk? I'll drive you to your car. And I don't want to see you in jail. 
any more than I'd like to see you in a dirty alley. Dead. Well, I, I won't listen to you anymore. That's rotten talk. I'm going to print what happened to Dave Manzanotti. But I'm going to leave you out of it. This time. Well, it's a lie. If you don't want Johnny to find out that his father's been crossing him every day of the calendar, you better start figuring some way to clear yourself. <coughs> okay. I'll give you 24 hours. <laughs> of the turning point in a moment. You know, our servicemen overseas have a wonderful opportunity to observe new customs and traditions. And they find, too, that these ideas of other people aren't so strange after all. And take, for instance, the use that man has made of animals. You see teams of oxen in Italy and southern France. Donkeys are both for transportation and beasts of burden in Spain. Buffalo are the domestic animals of Iran and the Near Eastern countries. Camels in Africa, the elephant of India, and dog teams in Alaska. But when you understand the reasons behind the use of these animals, it doesn't seem strange that they should be used in other countries. Why camels in Africa? Well, because in spite of their bad tempers, they're well equipped for desert travel. Eyelids that keep out the sand, stomachs that can store up water for a long journey. Why dogs in Alaska? Because they're meat eaters. Ideal for a country with little vegetation. Why oxen in Italy? Because their strong muscles enable them to do heavy work that would, well, would literally kill a horse. These people are as fond of their animals as the American farmer is of his pedigree bull or his prize-winning sow. The same is true of other customs and traditions in all countries. The way of doing things may be different, but the ideals are the same. These customs are important to the people who follow them. And our servicemen are helping to maintain goodwill by observing the customs of other people in other lands. Now our producer, Mr. Cummings. Act two of The Turning Point, starring Fred McMurray as Jerry and Joanne Drew as Amanda. <laughs> your best friend with stars in his eyes that his father is more crooked than top. All the next day, I kept hoping that Matt Conroy would come up with something to clear himself. But what? He was in too deep. I wrote the Manzanotti story, figuring it wasn't the story that Johnny had told me to hush up. But I was afraid Johnny wouldn't see it my way, and I was so right. I was afraid to go near him at a party Amanda threw for him that evening. But Matt was at the party, too, and I kept hoping something good might come out of the evening. But, Johnny, darling, this is a party. I know, I know. And it's for you. Don't talk shop tonight. Somebody intimidated Mrs. Manzanetti so that she wouldn't say a word in my office today, but how did that somebody get to her? I refuse to talk shop But darling. there's some kind of a pipeline out of our office to Eichelberger. Uh, how long uh, whom do I have to buttonhole to get another of your water drinks, Miss Lee Hello, Jerry. I'll get you a refill. Talk to Johnny and keep it friendly. Hello, Johnny. That was a fine stunt of yours, publishing the Manzanotti story. Well, I gather Mrs. Manzanotti's arrived at the hearing perfectly briefed by the opposition. That's not the point. Uh-uh, uh-uh. Keep it friendly. The point is, how did you know what was going on at Pond Street? Well, uh, caught in the dark. You know what the story does to the committee, to me. I printed a simple story that happened to be true. I put terrific pressure on us to explain away the top secret stuff that's been leaking out of our office. Well, what's wrong with that? It's a tramp newspaper man stunt breaking our confidence for his Look, Johnny. I didn't tip where she was. I told a different story that I dug up for myself. And put me right on the spot. I thought something better of you, Jerry. Okay, Professor. This illusion starts setting in the minute you lose faith in Santa Claus. So go up. Wait a minute. Where are you running to? Tell Amanda I choose to get loaded in the library. Keep it friendly. <laughs> Jerry, I've got to talk to you. Okay, Matt. Look. I'm in a terrible, terrible spot. Yeah. I lost my temper last night. I'm sorry. That's all right, Matt. Suppose I admit what you said last night. Will you go along with me? That depends. The way people figure, a cop is supposed to be more than human. Work harder than anybody, be more honest than anybody, and pay for his own equipment. 
He's not supposed to want money or things for his family. He's altogether too high principle for that. Well, it was fine for a while. Then, somehow or other, you get to be 40. You have a kid growing up, and you want some things for him. And then you find you're in debt. Suddenly you find some easy money in your pocket. It isn't crooked money. That's good. And then you find they own you. They got me in a nutcracker, Jerry. You better help me. Well, there's only one, one thing you can do. Deal behind Eichelberger's back. Feed them phony information. And try to stay alive. Or you can tell Johnny the truth. No. I, I can't do that. Well, I can't think of anything else. Jerry, Eichelberger had me in the carpet this morning. Well? After your Manzanati story. He burned me for not having told him that a newspaper man was with us when we got the lead on the Manzanati woman. He called me a dumb flatfoot and a fly cop. And I had to take it. Is that all? No. He's giving me one more chance. There's a folder in the DA's old file he wants you to get. What? File on Lloyd Cass in 1934. Cass and blabbed about things that didn't mean anything then, but... They do now. They want that folder. How do I duck that and stay alive? You get it, man. Get it and give it to them. Only have it photo at first. Oh, I may be sad. What about that? What? Jerry, I thought I told you and Johnny to keep it friendly. Hi, man. Well, I, I got to go, folks. Well, well, thanks, Jerry. I'll look into that for you. Yeah. I'll start you a ham sandwich instead of a drink. Oh, thanks. Uh, you mind if I eat and run? Is your car downstairs? In the garage. Uh, give me the keys, huh? No. Okay. Operator, this is Miss Waycross's apartment. Would you order a cab right away? Thanks. Thank you very much, Miss Waycross. I'll see you later. Jerry! Operator, this is Miss Waycross. Please cancel that cab. Oh, Amanda. I canceled the cab. Get in, I'll drive. Oh. Where to? The criminal court building. Only don't drive up in front of the building. Can't you tell me anything about it? I'm afraid I can't, Mandy. Why are you following Matt Conroy? Did I say I was following Matt Conroy? All right, have it your own way. Eichelberger, it's Harrigan. Yeah? Conroy is fixing the crosses. He's having the cat on file photostatic. Well, are you there? Do you hear me? You still won't tell me why you were following Matt Conway. Not yet, Amanda. Is everything all right? I hope so. Yeah, if you'd only relax a little. Well, if only you would. Maybe we both should. All right. I know you don't think very much of me. Don't I? I went into this thing because Johnny was in it, and I had so much respect for him. Respect, huh? I thought I could do it for you. I know. Do you? 
I do now. You want to help, but I'm beginning to get scared. No, no. It'll be all right. You think so? Relax. You're better already, and I'm suddenly very hungry. Me too. I do. Well, then, there now, you've been under a great strain. No, but really, I cook quite well. I was a whiz in home economics. Oh. Well, then, by all means, let us quiz home and economize by being your guest, Miss Lake, So, there you have it. The story of my life, and if it made it, you made the week into your coffee, I'll replace it with our song. <laughs> Yeah, it's not a very inspirational biography, I'd say. I'd say a very dull one. This novel you wrote, sir, what was it about? About three chapters. No, I mean content. It was about young love in Mississippi. Oh, remind me not to read it. You bet I will. There's uh, one point in your life story escapes me. Johnny. Yeah. I went up to the university once to interview him. I thought I was a budding newspaper writer. And he fell in love with you. I suppose so. First sight? I guess so. Yeah. Now you have that kind of effect. What a nice thing to say. I thought you knew. I rather hope. Did you, Amanda? Did you? It's, it's getting late. Does it matter? I suppose so. Yeah, well, I'll, uh, I'll help you clean up. I'm great with dishes. There's no pun intended. <laughs> no, sir. You want me to go? Yes. Yeah. Mandy, you're not much good as a cloak and dagger girl. We've been yapping half the night, and what have you found out about me? Enough. Yeah. I guess we both have. Something we, we didn't want to know, maybe. You still want me to go, Amanda? Amanda? <laughs> Conroy never got to that oil station. He passed a small food market just as a plant ran out screaming, hold up, hold up. The honest veteran cop and Matt Conroy made him reach for his gun and start into the store. A gunman ran out, but his gun was ready. man was dead, too. And a truck that had been standing at the curb whirled away and disappeared. And that was it. That was how Neil Eichelberger paid off Matt Conroy, Johnny's old man. Let me tell your readers that my father, Matthew Conroy, was killed in the line of duty. No connection has been established between his death and his official position with crime commission. All of his friends are invited to the services. Well, that's all, gentlemen. Thank you. Amanda and I went to pay our respects to Matt's widow and to be with Johnny. I went out on the porch to have a smoke and a think. I heard the screen door close behind me. Now. What about it? You stepped in front of a bullet, and that's all. What else? Yeah. Jerry, don't close me 
never felt so lost and so frightened. Hold me. Oh, Amanda. Mandy. Hold me. Amanda, wasn't it? I said it was a trap. Why, Jerry? Two what? years ago, Matt took money from the mob to put Johnny through college. He's been using Matt ever since. And yesterday, on my very excellent advice, he tried to double cross me. Oh, yeah. They pushed him into a trap. They paid him off. The police think it was line of duty, but it wasn't. What do I do now, Amanda? Call the cops? What do I tell Johnny? That his father was a crook? Oh, my God. And what do I tell him about it? I don't know. Amanda, will you be... to this committee subpoenaing the records of Arco Securities, Mr. Eichelberger. Why, why should you? I, uh, Would you, Mr. Eichelberger? No. Well, why should I? I have absolutely nothing to conceal. Splendid. My hands are clean. Thank you, Mr. Eichelberger. That'll be all today. There, uh, Arco. Where did the money come from, Mr. Eichelberger? Arco. What was the holding company's name? Marco. Uh, why did we leave such a loophole, Hedigan? We had to for the income tax record, Neil. Uh, this professor had to come along with a bee in his bonnet and trip us up with Arco. Arco! So once these subpoenas of books were finished, yeah, there was one thing to do. The building's got to go. Go? But there were apartments upstairs. People. Yeah, you can wake them up and carry them out, Harry, and be a hero. You can't do it. You can't believe it, can you? <laughs> now, that's what makes it so good. A jury wouldn't believe it either. Would they, Harry? Would they? a friend and you make an ally. There's a thought for you to keep in mind, as many another American has. In 1945, Lyle Hayden was sent to Iran by a privately financed organization to help the farmers with their agricultural problems. At first, they were listless and disinterested. But Hayden started a small demonstration farm to show them what could be done. He began to drill for the water he was sure to lay beneath the villages. And when he hit it, his second-hand pump began pumping 15,000 gallons an hour. Well, now the Iranians welcomed his help. With their aid, he purified the water, removed the threat of malaria from the irrigation ditches, started a successful chicken breeding program. Then he opened a free school to teach the children reading and writing. And it was so successful that the Iranian Minister of Education asked him to organize his teaching methods in other villages. Hayden offered a teaching job to any young villager who, who could learn to read and write. The successful ones came from his night school classes. 
As the months and years went by, Hayden continued educational and agricultural programs throughout the country. And today, what prosperity the peasant farmers of Iran enjoy can be attributed to the tireless work of Lyle Hayden, who combined the best qualities of missionary and businessman to win the thanks of a grateful people. Once again, an unselfish American proves that by helping others, you help your country. The curtain rises on Act Three of The Turning Point, starring Fred McMurray as Jerry, Joanne Drew as Amanda, with Whitfield Connor as John. <laughs> Blasted Arco security shook half the city. Johnny and I raced down to the scene. There was nothing we could do. And the sounds of the injured and dying were more than anybody could bear. I let a couple of days go by before I dared go up and see Johnny Conroy. He was in the file room, alone, haggard, haunted. Johnny. Anything new, kid? I'll ask you. Anybody come out of that explosion alive? One or two still fighting. I listened to you months ago, Jim. Yeah? And you suggested I wasn't the man for the job. I changed my mind, Johnny. And we both have. You have. Then maybe you can tell me how long it's going to take to get the smell of burned flesh out of my memory. Oh, but you can't blame yourself. You are me. I was just a kid standing in the sun with a dream on my face. Look at those files. Thousands of pages of testimony. What good are they? The Arco files are the key to this case. They're gone. That's right, Johnny. To make a case against Eichel Berger now would take a major hunk of criminal evidence. Well, by the time that happens, if it ever happens, this committee will be just as dead. What do you mean, Johnny? I'm quitting. Okay. So we strike off a medal for Neil Eichelberger and all his foul time, huh? The winner and still champion of the Wolves, right? Does that suit you? How many more people do you expect me to kill? I've dug up a story, Johnny. It's a murder story. We play it right and we can panic Eichelberger into making a mistake. What murder? I'm going to have to knock you to your knees again, Johnny. What murder? Your father. What? There wasn't a piece pick up shooting his way out. It was a planned execution right down the line. Even the double-crossing that little Marty LaRue punk they used. They let LaRue shoot your dad, and then they shot down LaRue. I know it, Johnny. It figures. My hands were tied, though. I, I couldn't hit you again. Why? What would be their motive? Why did you do that? Matt was working with Eichel for time. He told me himself. He was trying to shake loose. They framed him dead. My father. A crooked cop. He died clean, Johnny. You went down shooting. Well, I can't stop you from telling the story. All you have to do is ask. I can't ask. All I can do is quit. But that means the whole investigation collapsed. They're going to point some other extreme lad. They you know they never will, Johnny. They'll see how much time and money produced absolutely nothing, and they'll drop it cold, you know that. A committee will be appointed to investigate the investigation, and they'll return a big report, and it'll be filed and forgotten. And the people wind up right where they were, at the mercy of the hoodlum. Is it so important to you? Yes, it is. You're the boy with a dream on his face now. No, I don't know. But I know this. Even allowing for the apathy of the people and their occasional indifference, the fact is they all want desperately to believe in a certain majesty of the law. And for people like us, like you and me, the greatest crime in law is lack of faith in the law. That's when we join hands with the hoodlum. Johnny, I've just come from the hospital. The news is pretty good. That's fine. What's the matter? I've been telling Johnny about his dad. Oh, Johnny, I'm so sorry. All I can add, Johnny, is if the new Eichelbergers can convince us that it's useless to try to beat them, then we might as well hand the whole country over to them and let them run it for us. Finish. Finish. Then I'll say that I don't think I need a speech about honor and integrity from either one of you. Yes. Yeah. May I speak to Johnny now? Sure. I'm sorry, Johnny. I understood what you meant about Jerry and me. 
I'm sorry I couldn't have told you. It's unimportant now. I can't apologize or ask for forgiveness. I can only ask you to try to understand that we tried very hard not to have it happen. Oh, but Johnny, don't let this influence your decision. If you walk out now, you'll regret it the rest of your life. Sometimes, sometimes a few people have to pay a heavy price to help the law. Let Jerry publish the story about Pop? What do you think? What about my mother? What about the people who died in the Arco fire? And Jerry has an angle. Oh, Jerry always has. If you can identify your father's murder with Eiffel Burger, you'll have them, Johnny. You'll pay them back. You tell Jerry. Tell him what? To print the story. Gorgeous gun, and I can prove it. Where are you? At a, at a place called Steve's Place. It's done. Yeah, 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 I know where it is. You wait there for me. Order yourself something and don't go away, huh? Okay? Okay. We can talk at this table, Carmelina. I want to know. Was that how Monty was killed? They hired Monty to kill that policeman. And then they killed Monty. Were you his wife? Yeah. But I didn't want him to get into it. I couldn't stop him. He was crazy to be a big guy. Yeah, I know. They told him they were going to make him a big guy. Who told him? In the next room, I heard them every word. A big guy. Who was in the room, Carmelina? Carmelina, did you see Monty's body? Yeah. I saw it. You'd like to have them pay for that, wouldn't you? Yeah. Who was in the room, Carmelina? A guy named Ackerman. Roy Ackerman? And somebody called Herm. Herm? Herm what? What was his last name? Carmelina, what was Herm's last... What are you staring at? Behind you. In the doorway. It's them. How did you know you were here? I don't know. I live in the next block. Have they seen you? Yes. Are they coming? Yes. Well, listen fast. There's a kitchen door behind you. When I say now, run for it. I'll be right behind you. Don't get lost and don't let them get you. Yeah. All right. Now. Hey, no. Only she hadn't slipped away from you, Jerry. Yeah, but she did slip away. The girl was crazy with fear. You got that piped up yet, Amanda? Five seconds. They'll kill her. If they get her, they'll kill her. I know, and this one will be on me. I know, I know. Here we are. Carmelina, give yourself up to the police. As long as you are at large, you are in danger of your life. The police are your only protection. Description. Carmelina LaRue, 27 years, 5 foot 6 inches, 115 pounds, large dark eyes, black hair, olive complexion. Phone that into the police. We've got to get to her before Eichelberger gets her. <laughs> Uh, what's the matter with you, Ackerman? You nervous? I'll tell you what's the matter, Eichelberger. That Dane is loose since he can talk. He talks to McKibben. You didn't ever stand up in court. We'll be sitting in court waiting to see if it'll stand up or not. I'll tell you who me. Ah, forget it. And I'll tell you something else. This guy, McKibben, is the only guy who can identify the LaRue dame. Anybody else they drag in is just a scared dame, but McKibben knows LaRue. You worry about the court, Eichelberger. I'm going to change our luck. No, you want, Ackerman. Now, one big mistake was knocking off Matt Conroy. Off to yourself, Eichelberger. Now, you heard what I said. Lay off McKibben. There was a girl somewhere hiding out in the jungle of the city, scared to death and with every trigger man in town looking for her. Wanting something to get me off the front page and into the obituary column. I put a shifty little informer named Pinky Smock on Ackerman's trail. Just by way of staying alive myself. You're my pal. You're my pal, Jerry. But I hear nothing. Well, keep working, Pinky. Find Ackerman and don't let him out of your sight. Let me know even if he coughs. Okay, okay. okay. 
I look at police lineups trying to find Carmelina. Nothing. Radio and TV spot announcements. Nothing. And then, the break. Yeah? Jerry McKibben, the Chronicle. That's right. Who are you? Hey, you don't know me, but my name is Sammy Lest. I'm a fight man. It takes to manage my LaRue. I think I can tell you where Carmelina is. Uh, where are you now? Well, I'm at the fights. Now, listen. I'll leave a ticket at the box office for you. You come along. I'll take the seat next to you as soon as I can get away. I got a boy in about here. How do I know this is on the square? You're not worried, are you, McKibben? You got nothing to worry about? I know what you mean. How safe can you be? All right, Sammy. I'll be there. So long, McKibben. What do you say, Sammy? What do you say? Okay is what he said, Mr. Ackerman. Okay. Okay, Mr. Ackerman? <laughs> <laughs> I, I just spoke to Jerry's office. They said he was running down a lead on Carmelina. Oh, no. Did they say where he'd gone? The fight. Hey, Hal, Creepy. I've been looking high and low for you. Hey, who told you I was here? In your office. I told him it was important. And, Hal, it's important. Well, you found Ackerman? I found him right here. And I saw him point you out to one of his out-of-town cricket there's a gun on you, pal. So watch it. I gotta go. Thanks, baby. I'll be seeing you there, pal. The gun. Where? Where? When? When? Maybe when the crowd roars so they won't hear the shot. No, he's waiting for a clear shot. I can't believe if I stand up, there'll be a shot from somebody and I'll go down to stay. You've got to wait. You've got to wait and go out to the crowd. Carmelina Town. We've got Alfred Berger and Harrigan and Austin and the whole mob. Uh, the gunman? Yes. Yeah. Wait a minute. Don't talk. But Carmelina talked, you said. You said that as if we at least got some value for the price. What price? Not just me. Mm. Amanda. Where's Johnny? Sometimes. Someone has to pay a great price to uphold the majesty of the law. Johnny. He tried to protect you and me from the sun. Yeah. Yeah, he stood in the schoolyard with his books under his arm. 
and a dream on his face. And the flagpole fell on him. The least we can do is set the flagpole up again for him. Isn't it, Jerry? Yeah. Check. <laughs> 